Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to History Heights. I'm Gail Masinda. We typically associate the name of Samuel Morse with that famous code that bears his name. And for sure, his work with the Telegraph and Morse code totally changed the way our nation and the world communicated, especially over great distances. But Morse had another very important achievement that's often overlooked or simply missed. It was in the field of photography. We talk more about the varied careers of this multi-talented man in another video, and the link is here and also down below this video. But for the next few minutes, let's take a closer look specifically at the photography of Samuel Morse. It is often forgotten that Morse was a very talented painter. In the first portion of his adult life, he made a living by painting portraits. Morse wanted to be known as what he called a historical painter. His interest was in large, as in very large, paintings of historical significance. While he was certainly artistically capable of success, the public just didn't follow along as Morse hoped they would. It probably didn't help matters that in 1834, Morse became involved with the nativist movement, which even at that time, many viewed as a very bad decision by an otherwise very good man. Morse eventually left painting to devote his time to inventing. He worked very hard and spent a great deal of time and money in obtaining patents for his inventions. To protect and promote his work beyond the United States, he traveled to other countries as well. In 1838, he was in France doing just that. This was not the first trip to Paris for Morse. In fact, he lived there for a time and painted one of his masterpieces, the Gallery of the Louvre, while living there in 1831. He was friends with other Americans living in Paris too, including author James Fenimore Cooper. It was during his voyage back to the United States in 1832 that he began sketching his ideas for the machine that would become the telegraph. And so now in 1838, Morse was back in France again, this time to demonstrate and explain his telegraph. The public and the scientific community loved it. But much to his frustration, the French bureaucracy was very slow to respond. So Morse ended up staying in Paris longer than the month he had originally planned. By March of 1839, his finances as well as his patience exhausted, he decided to return to the United States. And here is where our story connects with photography. Let me know if you find this story interesting by taking a moment to click that like button. It will really help spread the reach of these unique stories from history. And be sure to let us know in the comments which achievement of Morse do you feel is the most significant. And I thank you. Back to our story. Louis Daguerre was a French painter and printmaker. While today he is best remembered for his method of making a permanent photographic image, the daguerreotype, in the 1830s in France, he was more widely known for his dioramas. These dioramas were very popular as entertainment, with a specially built theater featuring massive theatrical paintings and lighting effects that produced a visual spectacle never before seen. At the same time Daguerre was producing his dioramas, his work to perfect the photographic process which bears his name continued. Through hard work and many improvements over many years, in 1838 Daguerre finally felt ready to show examples of his photographic images to his colleagues. They were astounded at the details preserved in these images. Each daguerreotype is a one-of-a-kind image that takes many complex steps to create before it is finally preserved on a highly polished silver-plated sheet of copper. Daguerre saw his new invention as important to science but also to art and he promoted it as such. He preserved images as diverse as dead spider and other insects, seashells, fossils, the moon, and on to scenery
and still life compositions. The still life daguerreotypes were the first artistic creations that were ever preserved by mechanical means. Samuel Morse and Louis Daguerre had much in common. They were about the same age. At this time, Morse was 47 and Daguerre was 52. Both were gifted artistic painters who had turned their focus to inventing. Neither spoke the other's language very well. The inventions these two men had created, Morse with his telegraph and Daguerre with his daguerreotype, were the buzz of Parisian society. But both men were struggling to get their inventions, their intellectual property, secured by the French government. Morse was very interested in Daguerre's work. Years before, Morse had attempted a similar process but was unsuccessful. So Morse wrote to Daguerre and asked if the two could meet and each demonstrate their inventions to the other. Daguerre agreed, and on March 7, 1839, they met at Daguerre's home, which was located on the upper floors above the theater where his dioramas were produced. Their shared interest led to an instant camaraderie. After the visit, Morse described the daguerreotype as one of the most beautiful discoveries of the age. While stationary objects could be seen with great clarity and attention to detail, moving objects could not. This famous image by Daguerre is considered the very first photograph that contains a person. Here is how Morse described it. Objects moving are not impressed. The boulevard, so constantly filled with a moving throng of pedestrians and carriages, was perfectly solitary, except an individual who was having his boots brushed. His feet were compelled, of course, to be stationary for some time, one being on the box of the boot black and the other on the ground. Consequently, his boots and legs are well-defined, but he is without body or head because these were in motion. At noon the next day, March 8th, Daguerre came to visit Morse, and they spent more than an hour together with Morse demonstrating and explaining his electromagnetic telegraph to a reportedly very impressed Daguerre. Morse arranged to bring some photographic equipment back to the United States with him, and Daguerre agreed to send additional instructions on his process. But hang on to your hats. At the exact same time Morse and Daguerre were meeting, unknown to them, in another part of town, Daguerre's seer and home were on fire and burned to the ground. In this great loss, Daguerre's early works, including those taken with a telescope and a microscope, were gone forever. Also gone were years of his written records of his experiments and research. Less than 25 of these very early photographs attributed to Daguerre still survive. Thankfully, the knowledge that Daguerre worked so hard to obtain still remained, and he was able to resume his work. The next day, now March 9th, Samuel Morse began his return journey to the United States. After his arrival in New York, he wrote a letter to Daguerre to assure him that throughout the United States, your name alone will be associated with the brilliant discovery which justly bears your name. Morse also saw to it that Daguerre was made an honorary member of the National Academy, the first honor Daguerre received outside of France. At that time, Morse was a professor of literature and design at New York University. His office was located in what was known as the Old University Building. Morse took out part of the roof and replaced it with a skylight. Three notable firsts took place here. Morse and another professor, John William Draper, installed cameras in the room thereby creating the first photography studio in the United States. Morse believed that photography was not just a hobby, but a true art form that deserved to be studied and respected. 
Morse taught a class on the history of art and its relation to photography. And these classes and others became the first photography classes in the United States. The first photograph ever taken in the United States was shot from Morse's studio window. It is a photograph of the Unitarian Congregational Church across the street from the studio. In his journal, Morse noted that the plate was in the camera for 16 minutes, which explains why these really early photographs don't have moving objects like people in them. At age 17, Matthew Brady went to New York and soon became one of the first students enrolled in this new photography school. 22 years later, mankind first saw the people as well as the death and destruction of war, in this case, the Civil War, as documented through the works of Matthew Brady, a student of Samuel Morse. After two years, Morse left the photography studio and devoted his time to his telegraph and other interests. In May of 1844, as Morse used his telegraph to tap out the message, What God Hath Wrought, his name was forever connected with the telegraph and his famous code. Morse certainly viewed photography as an art form. I wonder what he might think of the selfies people post on social media today. It's certainly another reminder that although we can learn from the past, we don't live there. Go be awesome today. Make your own history and stick around for another amazing story from United States history.